OK. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about open source. Um, and I'm going to be doing so in story form. So there's going to be a story, and there will be lessons from the story. Um, and I hope you like that. But first, the formalities of, a t of any talk, really. Um, I'm Mitchell Ashimoto. Shane did a good intro of me. I go pretty much anywhere that matters on the internet as Mitchell H. So you could find me that way. Uh, by day, I'm an ops engineer. I don't do that much Ruby by day. Um, I work for Keep. We do mobile rewards. By night, uh, I do open source. Most of this, I'd say 95% is spent doing Vagrant. Uh, the other 4% is generally Vagrant-related shenanigans. And then the final 1%, I try to be a caring Rubyist where I feel like I have something to offer. So we are all here because of open source. Open source is bringing us together in this room at this conference today. Uh, if you want to get more technical about it, we're here because this small Asian man decided to create a programming language that we think is pretty cool. Um, that's obviously Ruby. And Ruby's open source, so we're here. We're brought together. Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that we all here love open source. And even if that's not true, maybe there's someone here who's kind of grumpy about it and doesn't actually love it. Uh, we all use open source. <laughs> um, and some of us here, probably quite a few of us actually, some of us more than others, I see some pretty exciting faces. Um, some of us create open source as well. And uh, let's give a round, of, a round of applause to those people, because. And, and this talk is about creating open source. And it's about those people, or people who want to become those people. There's three major goals I have for this talk. If you've never created open source before and you want to, hopefully you walk away realizing you're able to do it and you, and you do it with, with confidence and, and not fear. Um, if you already have open source, maybe you could improve your creation based on what I've learned and some of my mistakes that I've made and lessons that I've uh, learned. And um, if anything, if you don't want to be involved directly in open source, then Maybe I could help you understand what goes into others' open source. Um, because there's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I've been able to see you know, that side of the curtain for some time now. And that's what I want to share with you. So now we're at the story part. Um, like any story, there are lessons. Um, but I'm going to tell the complete story before we reflect on it and, and learn something from it. So, the next, I would say, 20 minutes or so is going to be my personal story of how I got into open source, why I even care about open source, um, and why I do what I do today, and what keeps me going. And it's not all roses. So it's not that long ago. Um, we're just stepping back to 2009. I was on Christmas vacation in Fort Collins, Colorado. I have family there. And uh, I worked for a rail shop, uh, pretty standard at the time, um, similar to Hash Rocket or Pivotal um, on a much smaller scale. And my boss came to me and said, can you do some quick maintenance on project A? And this is on, I remember the date, is December 21st. And if you don't celebrate Christmas, you don't know when it is. Christmas is December 25th. So this is four days before Christmas. He goes, and, and to elaborate on this a little bit more, he says, it's going to be a maximum four hours of work. It's only copy changes. Like, you don't even need to program. Um, and an important detail is Project A is from early 2009. And anyone who works in a rail shop knows you see new projects every couple months. So I was four or five, three or four projects past Project A at the time. Um, oh, and, and he said he would pay me quadruple time. <laughs> so, uh, whoa. And so I was like, OK, four hours of work, 16 hours of pay. The days leading up to Christmas are kind of boring anyway. So I'll find some way to do this to not be rude to my fam and not be rude to my family. So I said, sure. Um, I kind of think back on this day a lot because I don't know if I said if, if, if I said if I didn't say sure to this I'm not confident that Vagrant would exist today but I said I said yes and eight hours later <laughs> I was I was pissed um, so after eight hours at the eight hour mark around seven and a half hours I had got to the point where I could even run Project A on my laptop again because we're three or four projects past that. Um, and then 
two hours later, I finished the copy changes, and, and it was easy work once I was able to work. Um, and I got paid 40 hours, because it took 10 hours. Good. Uh, but I was still pissed. And uh, I thought, why was there so much in the way of me just working? Why can't I just download my project, do something um, that's not manual, and then get working? Uh, but I had a, a good Christmas. My uh, pain disappeared for the next few days and spent time with my family. Then in early 2010, I came back to school. I went to the University of Washington. I spent four years here. Yeah, cool. Uh, it's very cool to be giving this talk in Seattle. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, so I went to the University of Washington, and students have a lot of time. So I, I sat and thought about this project, and uh, I, I, I really thought about this problem and talked to some people, um, John Bender, if you, you might know him, um, and I thought, you know, I think I could fix this in some way that doesn't suck. And um, before we go into that, I do want to note my emotional state of the time about open source. Uh, I have been using open source at that time, or well, my life, since I was probably like 13 um, with PHP software, and I had looked up to these, I had always looked up to people in open source, and I realized that open source gave me everything I was at the time, and I was interested in giving back in some way. I'd always wanted to. Um, in addition to that, there were famous people to me that I saw, and just like my sisters going into high school right now have famous people in pop culture that I can't understand, um, these, <laughs> these are famous people to me that I don't expect people outside this room to really understand but I think you guys will be able to relate. So one of the famous people at the time, there's many, but I'm using people that you'll all recognize, was people like John Resig. He created jQuery, of course, um, when he was like 15 or something. <laughs> um, and this guy you definitely know, looking all cute in this picture, um, Yehuda. Um, at the time, he worked on Merb and jQuery. Now he works on, or has worked on, Rails, Bundler, Rubinius, Thor, Rails, that app, like prolific uh, in every way. And I looked up to these people for four main reasons. Um, that was, they all work on something that they're really passionate about. There was no one at the beginning of their, their lives that poked and prodded them and said, you need to make this thing, you need to make this thing. Um, they just did it because they actually wanted to and they, they loved to do it. It was, it was pure work out of love. Um, that gets a little more complicated when you get to the caliber, I think, that Yehuda's at. I'm sure he feels quite a lot of pressure, but, but at least to get in it, it's all passion. Then they get to share this passion with the world. The internet and open source makes them able to, to say, world, look at this thing that I think is cool and I want to share with you. And not just the thing I made, the way I built it. You get to see all the insides and you get to see everything I went through to build this, um, and you could help me build it too if you think it's cool. Their ideas actually cause visible change in the world. Um, jQuery, for the John Rez example, jQuery might not have been the first, um, but it was certainly, I think, the, the pivotal uh, framework that made front end development approachable by hu the average human being. And, um, I think we went crazy for a while with lots of flashiness and stuff, but that wouldn't have even been possible without what he did initially. And, and that's huge change. Um, on the rail side, of course DHH made rails, not Yehuda, but, but same, the project. Um, on the rail side, the rapid prototyping of websites wasn't, we didn't see that before rails. Like, so maybe the 15 minute blog is kind of gimmicky. It is, but he built a blog in 15 minutes. It didn't look great but it functioned. It wasn't very secure, but it worked. Um, and, you know, they, Rails rumbles, people build amazing things in 24 hours. And that's because some guy built that thing. And now it's many people because it's open source. But it started with one person. And finally, they get to travel the world sharing their ideas. And this has a superficial side to it, I admit. But they get to share their ideas with people. Um, and they get to, people get to meet them. They get to talk about what they love. It's a cool thing. And I was always raised, um, my parents raised me to really value travel. And we traveled, we went, all every two years we went on some big trip. 
experience other cultures, so on. So I have always loved travel. Um, I didn't even apply to a college in state. That wasn't even an option in my head. I've always loved travel, so this was very cool to me. And at, in 2009, I wanted this more than anything else in the world. Um, this was where my head was at the time. And so I started working on this thing. Um, January 1st, I committed some useless thing. And, and I started. And six weeks later, we had an initial release. Um, John Bender and I worked on this, and he was pivotal to the project. And um, we got Vince made. I'm sure you've seen this around. Um, he was real expensive, $15 from DeviantArt. <laughs> like some of the best $15 I ever spent. Um, made a website. That pretty much sucked because um, documentation sucks. And then we, and actually important, we did all this because John and I realized that we had no street cred as like open source developers. And, and building something and announcing it is cool, but we didn't think anyone would take us seriously uh, because they didn't know who we were. And we thought, or we, we agreed that a mascot and a website somehow adds this air of legitimacy to the project. <laughs> and you're laughing, but it's totally true. It totally worked. Like, we fooled everyone into thinking that this was, this was a serious thing. And so, and, and that, that was the motivation behind it. And so, we launched on Hacker News. I don't think that's abnormal. Um, hung around on the top for a couple days. Got good feedback. Um, pretty neat. And shipping feels amazing. I think any, everyone in this room could probably level with this, is that when you work on something, people don't really see the work that goes into what we build. And we spend with teams usually weeks, months maybe, on something. Um, and there's a lot of hard times. And at the end, we get to package something up and show it to someone and say, look what I built you. Um, and, and show it to the world. And that is an amazing feeling. So that was a good day. Um, and actually, at that point, everything was going pretty much swimmingly. Like, I don't think anything could have gone better at this point. We had built something that we used uh, because we cared. We had very quickly, we both worked at different rail shops. Um, both rail shops very quickly adopted what we built. Um, Hacker News, good, good uh, feedback. IRC Channel had 15 people just idling in it, which is cool. Um, everything was going good. I liked it. So that was in March 2010. The times between that is kind of boring. So, but between that, basically what happened was I listened to user feedback. I continued to refine and improve the project. I was probably too friendly as a maintainer. I think after listening to Ryan's talk yesterday, he might think that I, I cared a little bit too much. But I didn't want anyone to have any reason to not, to not use Vagrant, pretty much. So anything that came at me, I just like did it. And I was in college, so I had a ton of time. <laughs> and um, I got to around version 0 0.5, and I started to notice something, though, at this point. I think I probably noticed it earlier, but I was in denial for a long time. Um, but this is when it started coming out. But I started noting that downloads were stagnating to, like, 500 a release. And in addition to downloads, as other metrics, I noticed that the average IRC users went from, remember, it's a very small project so at this time. Um, so average IRC users went from 20 people to, like, 15. And people who idle in your IRC channel are usually the most dedicated. So losing those, those people, whoever they were idling in there, um, really sucked. And, and I would search every day, multiple times a day, for Vagrant and VagrantUp.com on Twitter. And tweets started going down to like once every two weeks. Uh, it was just stagnated. And the feeling of failure started to creep in. I started to, to ask myself, what am I doing wrong? What, I care so much about this thing. Why don't other people see it? Or do, am, am I seeing something that doesn't exist? What's, what's going wrong? And it, I didn't lose love for the project. I still use it every day. I still worked on it every day. Um, but at this point, I definitely started to lose heart. And uh, the, the worst, I think, I think a general life thing, but in this case for me, it's just when you give everything to something or someone, and that thing does not grow uh, positively the way you expect it to, it hurts. And 
At this point, I had given everything for months. And someone might be like, dude, it's open source. It doesn't matter. But, but this was, for me at that time in my life, this was everything that mattered. And I couldn't understand why it was failing. Uh, this sucked. So that was the summer of 2010. Um, in late 2010, something cool happened. Carl Lurch happened. And I don't know how many people in this room know who this is. Like half the people. Uh, I just like more, but half the people. So Carl um, is this guy, and this was a this is a contemporary picture of Carl in 2009. And he worked for Engineer Art at the time. He worked was a Rails core committer and a co-creator of Bundler. He's the Carl and Carl Huda. And um, he came into the Vagrant IRC channel during these like crappy times. And I remember telling John Bender was sitting next to me, and I hit him. And I went, look who that is. And he was like, who's that? And I was like, he could change things for us. He's, I, this is like one of my heroes. This is one of my heroes. And he was there. Um, and time went on, and he realized I was working in Mountain View at the time. So he invited me to the engineer offices. And I spent a, every week kind of for a few weeks of the summer working there. Um, I worked on, I didn't know what was happening. I just went there because I got to sit next to these people that I had idolized for so long. Um, I sat there working on Vagrant, which didn't matter. And next to me, I had Carl working on Bundler, and Yehuda was working on Rails. And that was kind of a cool environment to be in, very inspiring. Um, and it was just like, I was kind of like freaking out. And um, of course, what some of you may know or may not know, what turned out, what resulted from this hanging out at Engine Yard was um, this blog post. This was a blog post announcing that Engine Yard decided to sponsor Vagrant. And they weren't sponsoring it in the way that they sponsored Rails or they sponsored Rubinius or so on, because um, Vagrant was small. But they, they, Dr. Nick and Carl somehow saw something, and they wanted to help me. And Dr. Nick specifically said, in I don't have an Australian accent, but he said in an Australian accent, he prefixed this with mate, I'll give you that. But he said, what do you need to succeed? And I said, I need people. And I don't need people to help me work on the project, not right now. I need people to know it exists. I need to go out there and tell people that this thing exists, they should use it for whatever reason, and I need them to know. So I need to go to meetups, regional conferences, national conferences. I, need, I just need to get the word out. And Engineer Art decided to um, help me financially a little bit. Um, they also helped by reviewing my proposals to speak, and um, I, it worked. I went on a little mini conference tear for six months, and the result was people were starting to talk about Vagrant again. And I wish I put the screenshot of Google Analytics in here, but there's a clear inflection point um, where the, the, the open source grant hit, where it started picking up again. And that was huge. So thank you, Carl. Um, early 2011 now, we're catching up. I moved to San Francisco, got a new job, met new friends. I graduated from UW. Um, I still loved Vagrant, but this was the first time that I had a full-time job and had to work on open source, like nine to five kind of job and had to work on open source. And this was new. And so I was tired when I got home from work and this was a new feeling and I wasn't having time to work on open source as much as I wanted to, so I was getting frustrated. And regret or frustration leads to burnout and I was burnt out. And I wasn't burnt out because I didn't like Vagrant or I didn't want to work on it. I was burnt out because I was feeling regretful about what work was doing to it. And this burnout for me led to guilt and this self-pity where when I did decide to finally work on it again, I felt guilty that I hadn't and then I felt sorry for myself. And then because I was in this negative, sad cloud mood, I didn't actually work on it. And like th this just cycled and it was, it was terrible. Um, and that went on until mid-2011. Um, and in mid-2011, I went to, I was invited to DevOps Day Sweden to give some talk. And I decided to give a talk on DevOps. It wasn't even Vagrant related. Um, and I stood up in front of the room, give the talk. There was about 200 people in the room. Um, and as just part of the general intro slides, I said, uh, I made this cool thing called Vagrant. If you know it, that's cool. And I, it's, I expected it to be like these intro slides, where I was just like, Ch -ch -ch, like next, next, next. Um, and I said that. And what happened was, was pivotal and cha life changing at the time. Um, everyone, all 200 people in the room stood up and clapped. And that's when I realized that people somewhere, somehow, I couldn't see 
until that moment, the blinders went off that people somewhere loved this project. And funny story, people actually really love it. Um, at that same conference, I was talking to some guy in a standing table, cocktail table thing, and out of the corner of my eye, this guy walks up to me, and uh, you could tell he's like nervous. You could visually notice he's nervous. He's like kind of hunched over because um, he doesn't want to make eye contact, and he, he's walking kind of funny, and he has like his fist, he has something in his hand, and I'm talking to this guy, so I don't, I'm just like, what's this guy doing with his hand? <laughs> and and he, he kind of like slowly walks up and just like drops things on the table and goes, like whispers almost because he's nervous. Um, he just goes, hey, I love Vagrant, I made these for you, and like shuffled away. And, <laughs> and I got 15 of these. Um, I, I, I talk to him now, he's a normal person, he's very cool. Um, but that happened. Uh, and, and this conference was the turning point because I realized that everyone there, at least in that, as that DevOps community, was excited about it, and I didn't realize this, and my fear instantly disappeared. Burnout was solved, everything was better, and a few months later, I had 1.0 out. And it's been just flying ever since. And, and that was huge. It, and 1.0 was one of the proudest days of my life. Um, I, I, was, I said one of the, but I think it is the proudest day of my life, because more than college or whatever. Um, because, because you build this thing, and as, as my own toughest critic, to be able for myself to say I feel comfortable with this enough to call it 1.0 and ship it is kind of a milestone, and that was cool. So today, um, I'm gonna just, sorry, like four slides of kind of tooting my own horn, um, which kind of sucks, but um, Vagrant is probably like less than 1% of the companies using Vagrant. It's gotten big, and I speak now. It looks a lot like me right now. <laughs> and um, I'm an O'Reilly author. Uh, Vagrant is published routinely, and this was last week. And, but most importantly, today, I work on something that I'm passionate about. And I've worked on it every day for two and a half years, and I love it. And I, and I couldn't imagine wanting to work on anything else because I love this so much. Um, <laughs> thank you. I get to share it with the world. Vagrant is open source and free. I, I package it up and say, here you go. Or look at how it works, I don't care. Um, I get to share it. Um, the ideas behind it, not all mine, do cause visible change. Not on the uh, scale that Rails or jQuery does, but, but company, on, on a direct way, like Puppet Labs and Ops Code, their training programs revolve around Vagrant because it's the best way to train people to use those sort of things. Um, companies like Yammer and O'Reilly and, um, I don't know, Nokia um, have formed entire dev teams around these ideas. And that's really cool. On a more higher level that I can't prove, but I feel like it, is when I first made Vagrant, no one virtualized anything, um, unless you worked at Amazon or Google or something. Um, nowadays, I think it's more normal than not for people to, to just talk about virtualization for development. And even if they're not using Vagrant, I feel like that had a lot to do with it, and that's really cool. And I get to travel the world sharing these ideas. In the past 12 months, I've talked at around 15 conferences in various places, and that's really cool. So I'm not famous by any means, but I am living my dream, and this is what I dreamt and what I wanted in 2009, and it's happening right now, and I'm very happy. So now that's the story. Uh, to reflect on that story and the lessons I've learned from this happening in my life. The most important thing is anyone could be successful at open source. There was nothing that made me special um, to get to where I am. Anyone could do it if you want to. You have to care about the problem you're solving. I think too much I see people just open sourcing something they don't care about and that helps because at least people could see the code but for something to truly blossom, you need to find a problem that you have and you need to solve that problem um, in a way that you feel like you can help make it better. You don't need to solve the problem. You could, if you could just make it better, then that's, that's good enough. Um, you need to give a damn about user experience. I think, I think as developers, at least in my, my experience, 
what I thought was cool about my project was that it controlled virtual machines like like a wizard. And I thought that was cool. But when I go to conferences and someone walks up to me and praises me for the project, that is never what it's about. Because that's what it was built to do. If it doesn't do that, then it's useless. So that's not, that's not what's cool about it. What people praise me about is they say, hey, the documentation doesn't suck. Uh, the user, the errors that people get are actually friendly for people and they're not giant stack traces. And hey, you realize that people who don't use Ruby use Vagrant, so you saved us from the horror that is learning the Ruby ecosystem just to install your project by making installers. Like that's what people tell me and that's all user experience and that matters. And I think uh, a lot of open source projects just skip on this because they think the tech is cool and the tech is not cool, it's what it's supposed to do. Marketing, I think this was almost the fatal flaw or nail in the coffin for Vagrant, really close in 2010. Um, marketing not only works, it's absolutely necessary. When you make something that you think is cool, you need to go out with pots and pans and scream and yell, um, not by Ryan's house. Uh, but you, and you just need to tell anyone and everyone who will listen to you about how excited you are about what you made because the you build it and they will just magically come model didn't work for me and it doesn't work. Um, and it was only when I started sharing my ideas that people actually came. And now it's kind of at a point where people share the ideas for me and that helps. Uh, burnout, it's gonna happen. Uh, it might not happen with what you're working on but it's gonna happen at some point. And you just have to realize that it's caused by regret or frustration about something, identify it, chill out, it's fine to be burnt out for a while, and then just move on. Um, people will forgive you. No one even cared um, that I went through a few months of just doing maintenance and not pushing features. The only time I ever didn't push features. Um, no one cared. And, and that's okay. And I think this was the most surprising to me. I always, in 2009 it was, what am I gonna build that will, will get me what I want? What is, what's the project, what, what is the project that I need to build? And now it's, I realize that open source is far less about the project and it's definitely about the people involved with it. It's the community, it's that people help you, um, you meet people that work on other cool things and they, they care, all these people care. Um, I guess, example of this, I, when I landed here, I ran into Terrence at the airport. Terrence works on Bundler and Rescue and other stuff. And Terrence isn't related to Vagrant in any way. He's just a person in the community. And we just talked the whole time about what's wrong with Ruby, what sucks about Ruby gems, what sucks about Bundler. Um, and we just were like, and how do we fix this? And that's not what I work on, but it's cool because you're able to talk about these things with people. And so blank slide. Um, I realized this talk, you know, didn't have specific points about you need to do this specific thing to be successful, but at being like a Ruby library or something. But it had high level points um, that I think are more generally applicable to things, um, which is, you know, embrace that you're gonna fail. Um, have your heart in the right place in whatever you're working on. Um, care about your users and do it for the people not about the project, uh, not for the project. The people are the, the people are the people experiencing what you're building, so do it for them. Um, and if you have these things and you have an idea that doesn't suck, uh, then I don't see how you can fail. You, you can't fail. Uh, and that's about it. That's what I wanted to share with you today. So thank you. Thank you all for loving open source, because I love open source. And thank you for making open source or using it. That's it.